Good morning. Did anybody else besides me enjoy the, the band and the choir this morning? Yeah. <laughs> I'm thrilled that you're here. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm, I'm setting my timer so that we won't go into the third service. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful that you're here today and uh, we're celebrating uh, what is really the most remarkable moment in human history. Uh, people have died forever, but the people who come back from the dead, that's quite another story. And you might have some serious reservations about that, so I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about that today. All four Gospels tell the story of Jesus' resurrection, but we're going to go to John's Gospel this morning and, and have a look at it from there. And chapter 20, beginning of verse 15, Jesus asked Mary, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. You see my hands? Reach your hand out and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, we're here today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And quite honestly, that's difficult for some people to believe. A lot of people will say, well, I like the historical figure of Jesus. I like the things that he taught about. But to say that I believe that he came back from the dead, that sounds more like myth and legend than reality. And, and there are people who would say, why isn't it enough just to believe in the teachings of Jesus? Like we do this all the time at funerals. I've officiated lots of them. I've heard lots of family members say things like this. We, we will just keep, and they'll refer to their loved one, alive in our hearts and in our minds. And we will remember the things they said and they taught us. And we will carry those out and we will pass those on. And, and that's the way that that person lives on in us. And, and lots of people just go, so why can't it be like that for Jesus? In fact, some people believe I could probably be a Christian if you didn't ask me to believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. But here's an important thing to know, and that is that faith is not just about believing what Jesus said, it's also believing what he did. It's not just the words. He made claims. He said he would suffer. He said he would die. And he said he would rise again on the third day. Now, what you have to appreciate is that it was dangerous in those days to say that you believed that Jesus raised from the dead. That was not accepted theology. 
And it, it was considered revolutionary language, not revolutionary in the way that we think groundbreaking, but revolutionary in the way you're trying to unsettle and upend things. Now, I, I have, uh, I've met lots of people who, well, let's just check. How many here have met someone who have lied? Uh, how many is sitting very close to the person who, no, don't. And, and the person sitting next to you just said, they just lied, and now I can raise my hand. Uh, question, if you knew something was a lie, would you die for it? I don't think we would. In fact, I've never met a person that would die for a lie. What's that? I still didn't catch it, but... So, what is it? Communism. Oh, communism. Okay. <laughs> So it starts with a C, but the word is crucifixion and very, very different. So, yeah. If we go into politics, we're all going to hell, and that's how that is. So. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's just this idea that uh, people don't die for a lie. And the, the example that's given, it may be a lie, but they believe it's true. And here's the thing, there are people who won't even die for the truth. I know lots of people that if the, if the pressure is enough and the conversation gets uncomfortable, they'll deny truth just to get out of it and hope they can mend the fences when it's all over. Something happened in the lives of the disciples who went from people who were locked up and afraid and hiding out in huddles to people who would boldly proclaim that Jesus raised from the dead. How do you explain that transformation? So, well, they just, they had a lot of faith. They really didn't. Uh, first of all, uh, when, when Mary goes to the, the tomb, she's not expecting to see a resurrected Jesus. She's expecting to see a closed grave. And when it's open, she doesn't think, oh, that's right, he said he was going to raise again. She thinks, oh, they moved him. There are things that we deeply believe. In, in Jewish culture, they believed in the possibility of resurrection, but that was going to be everybody all at once at the end. And they did not believe that God would ever come down in human form. And some of the Western religions, like Greek and Roman, they would tell stories about how sometimes the gods would come down incognito and pretend to be human. But Jesus didn't come incognito. He came incarnate. He didn't come to hide who he was. He came to reveal who God was. Very different things. And so when they were confronted with just unbelievable difficulties, they couldn't imagine that the words Jesus said were true. They had these deeper held beliefs, and so do we. There are ideas that we like. There are, there are concepts that we hope are true. But when the pressure's on and we're experiencing pain, the tendency is to default back to those things that we kind of hang on to. So once again, Mary didn't expect to see a resurrected Jesus. What kind of things are in your heart that you deeply believe? And what kind of things do you think are going to make a difference in your life? You know, if I could have a relationship with that person, that would really change my life. If I could have that job or make that much money or hold that position or live in that neighborhood, oh, that would really, I would really be someone. And what we're looking for is someone else or something else to save us. And somewhere inside of us, there's this deeply held belief Somebody or something can do that. But when it comes right down to it, we struggle to believe that God can do that. And when I say it, in a room like this, a lot of us will just start beating ourselves up for our lack of faith. And so let me ask you, where was Mary's faith? How about Thomas? All of the disciples, they said, yes, yes, we saw him. And, 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 and Thomas has a nickname, Doubting Thomas. That's his nickname. That's the nickname that was given to him just because he's the guy who says, even seeing the wounds are not enough for me, I'm going to have to put my finger in and poke the spot. That's amazing. We have to bring our lack of faith to Jesus. You see, a lot of us think that faith is the gift we give God. And actually, faith is the gift God gives us. Nobody had faith in the resurrected Jesus until Jesus gave them that gift. 
And so if you think faith is a gift you give to God, then you have to hide your doubts. But if you think faith is the gift God gives you, you can share your doubts with him and get something else in return from him. Faith is also believing in Jesus's past more than your own past. Every one of us have a past, and for some of us, it's a little bit checkered. Some of us are, are uh, well, we have to, we hope nobody finds out some of the things we've done. There's a lot to live down and a lot to answer for. But you want to know what? There's some other people, they've actually done a pretty good job. There's some rule-keeping people that are pretty good about that and fairly generous and reasonably loyal, and, and they're, they're, they're really good people. You can spot them on the throughway. They're the people going the speed limit in the left-hand lane. <laughs> and their goodness is causing other people to curse. So I'm so grateful for their, their rule-following capacities and, and their generosity and their loyalty and all of that. But would you please get over in the other lane? That's just all I'm asking. Yeah. So we think about our past and whether we think it's bad or it's good, we imagine that that's the basis on which God interacts with us. And what Jesus wants us to know, what scripture wants to reveal to us, is that God interacts with us based on the past of Jesus, not us. And his past was perfect. That's the basis that he interacts with us. We say, well, my past is, is pretty bad. Whose past is greater, yours or Jesus? Faith is accepting his past over your own. Faith is also believing that Jesus' wounds are enough. His wounds are enough. There's a lot of people who, when bad things happen in their life, they're pretty sure that God is punishing them for something that they've done at some point. And it really, there's no expiration clock on this. I've been in the hospital with a woman who was well into her 80s, and she had a terminal condition and only a few days left to live. And when I tried to talk with her and pray with her, she told me, I know that God is punishing me for something I did when I was a teenager. It's amazing how this thought just runs in our heads. And what, what scripture teaches us is that when God sees the wounds of Jesus, he considers that enough. Well, let's imagine you have a family member. Some of you don't have to, but let's, let's try our imagination today that you haven't talked with in a very long time. And let's imagine that they're in a cataclysmic accident. And let's imagine that you go to see their very broken and brittle body laying in the ICU unit of a hospital. And let's suppose that they're hooked up to all kinds of machines and tubes. In that moment, I have watched people's tears flow down their faces and they find words to be able to interact with someone. And it appears as though forgiveness has happened because, because, because now they've suffered enough. And when God looks at us, he's not waiting for us to suffer enough. Jesus suffered enough for us. And the question is, if the suffering of Jesus was enough for God, why isn't it enough for you? Do you really think God is going to demand two payments for your sins? The one that Jesus paid and then something else from you. The, the cross is not an accident. Even, but this is what's fascinating. Hundreds of years before it was ever created as a means of execution, there was a prophet, his name was Isaiah, and he foretold not only what crucifixion would look like, but that there would be someone who would be crucified with a purpose, with an intent that was very redemptive. It's found in Isaiah, and it says this, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. All of us. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Are the wounds of Jesus enough for you? you know, even with Thomas, the wounds of Jesus weren't quite enough. He wanted to actually poke his finger in. And some of us, don't we bring our set of conditions to God? I will believe in you if you give me the numbers to the megalotto. <laughs> I will believe in you if 
my grandma recovers, or my husband keeps his job, or my kid gets better, or we, we bring out these conditions to God. And here's the problem, is that God is not a designer God that's created by humans. All you have to read is just a few chapters in the Bible and you will find something in there that ticks you off. I'm going to ask you a very direct question. I want you to think very seriously about it. Is the only God you can believe in is a God who thinks and acts exactly like you. And in that scenario, who's God? Thomas has his conditions. Jesus shows him the wounds and he says, go ahead, put your finger in, put your hand in, go ahead. We're never told in scripture that that happened. In that moment, Thomas just says, my Lord and my God. If we get into the designing the God we like concept, what you know is every time people design gods, real people get hurt. We shouldn't be trusted to manufacture gods. We should go to the God who made us. So Jesus told Thomas, stop doubting, start believing. And the last point I want to make is this, is that faith is about going where Jesus sends us. Jesus had a very unusual greeting with his followers. I'll go ahead and ask the, the uh, worship team to come up. Uh, they're all locked up in a room. They're very afraid of things that's going to happen from here out. Uh, the person that they love the most and the greatest faith in has been killed brutally because crucifixion wasn't just about ending a life, it was about sending a message. If, if you claim that you are a king, if you claim you are a lord, this is what happens to you. And so they're terrified. And, and Jesus appears in the room that they're in. And, and he said probably something we need to hear today. Peace be with you. I, w I wonder if how many of us could use some peace today. And then he has this very unusual greeting. He, he goes, Whew. let's just be honest. If, if you're walking out today and I go to greet you and you go to shake my hand and I just go, Whew. That's probably the last time you're coming here. <laughs> I don't know who that guy is, but I can tell you what he had for breakfast. That's true. Yeah. Mm. What's he doing? The one who's alive is breathing life into the people who, even though their hearts beat and their feet ambulate, they're dead. They're not living, they're hiding, they're terrified, they're afraid. And Jesus tells them, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. When Jesus <laughs> begins to breathe life into us, it's not just so that we feel stronger or look better. It's so that we'll go places we would rather not go and hang out with people we would rather avoid and let go of things we would rather cling to. That that's what Jesus does for us. And that's life. This idea that I have to find the perfect little tribe of people who think just like me and hide out all the rest of my life and hope nobody finds me. Is that really our definition of life now? If it is, there's someone in the room and he's saying, peace, peace to you. It's time to stop living like you're dead. And it's time to receive the breath of the Holy Spirit into our lives that will compel us out into the world and an adventure that he fully intends for every one of us to live out fully. That's what Jesus has for us. So I'm gonna ask you to do something this morning. And, and I promise I won't embarrass anybody. That's not our, our MO here. But if you would just bow your heads, I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads because I'm gonna ask you to to think about this and if you're ready to make a decision to make one. And, and I'm not asking you if your past is perfect and I'm not asking you if you're completely confident that everything in scripture is true. That, that's not where we are this morning. I'm asking if you're willing to surrender your doubt to Jesus and see if he will give you a gift of faith back because it happened for all the disciples and what if it could happen for you today? That you could start a spiritual journey today that would make all the difference. So. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, over on 
on the, the, the side of the window that that's ha the side of the room that has windows towards the Beaver Road side. So, um, and anyone in that section over there, if you're willing to, I'm, I want to give my doubts to Jesus and I'm willing to receive a gift of faith from him today. I want to start my spiritual journey today. Anywhere in this section, just raise your hand and look right at me and I'll acknowledge you because I, I want you to know that I did see you today. So anywhere in this section, just raise your hand. You're ready to acknowledge doubts. I see that person back there, thank you. Anyone else, just go ahead. I see that person, I see that person, thank you. Lift him up, good night. I see that person, thank you. I see that person, I see that person, I see that person. Anyone else, I see that person, that person, and that person. Anyone else, I see that person, thank you. I'm in the next section over now. Anyone in this section right over here, just lift your hand good and high. Today you want to surrender your doubts to Jesus and see if he will give you a, a gift of faith back. Right over here, anywhere, just lift your hands until I acknowledge you. Anyone at all? All right, the center section right now. I see that person, I see that person, I see that person. Wow, that person, that person, that person, that person, that person. Keep them up good and high. That person, that person, that person, that person, that person, that person, that person. Anyone else? Okay, I'm in the next section over. Anyone over here, you wanna surrender to Jesus your doubt and, and take the gift of faith from him. I see that person, 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 that person. Anyone else in this section? All right, I'm all the way over by the windows now. Anyone over here, you wanna surrender? I see that person, that person. Anyone else, lift your hand good and high. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. Would you be willing, everyone in the room, would you be willing to pray this prayer with me this morning, out loud and together? Heavenly Father, I give you my doubts. I accept your past. I believe you will forgive me of mine. I receive your gift of faith today. In Jesus' name, amen. Could we just welcome all those folks into the family of faith this morning? <laughs> now you were given a card and I'm gonna ask everybody to do this. It's a spiritual survey. And it, on the bottom of it, it allows you to acknowledge if you made a decision today, that's great. We'd like to just send a couple things to you so that you're able to, to begin that spiritual journey well. Maybe for you, you're not convinced yet. You'd like to talk to a pastor or you'd like to be included in a community where maybe these conversations can take place. And maybe you're not interested at all. That's fine. We're not here to twist anybody's arm. If God can't change your mind, I can't and I'm not gonna try. But whatever that is, if you could just take a moment and fill that out. In just a moment, there'll be an opportunity for you to put that into a container and that'll help us to be able to follow up with you. Let's all stand to our feet this morning and let's lift our voices like the redeemed of Christ.